Here I've got a nice viewer suggested inequality. So what we want to show is that for all real numbers x, cosine evaluated at sine x is bigger than sine evaluated at cosine x. And we'll do this by trying to solve the equation where this left-hand side is equal to this right-hand side, see that there is no real solution, and then show that we have this side is bigger at some point, but then they both represent continuous functions. That means it's always bigger by the intermediate value theorem. Okay, furthermore, we'll use the following two trigonometric identities. One is a difference formula for sine, and the other one is a sum to product formula for cosine, or really it involves cosine and sine. Okay, so let's get into our solution. So like I said, we want to suppose by way of contradiction that we have some x, which is a real number, such that this is equal to this. So in other words, the cosine of the sine of x is equal to the sine of the cosine of x. Great. And then from here, I'll just rewrite this right-hand side using kind of the phase shift formula that relates cosine and sine. So this is equal to the cosine of pi over two minus the cosine of x. So in general, we have sine of theta is the same thing as cosine of pi over two minus theta. Okay, so that means we have the following equation. So we have cosine of sine of x minus cosine of pi over 2 minus cosine of x equals 0. Okay, but now we've got this difference of cosines. So we can apply our sum, or really our difference to product formula. But maybe before we do that, it might be nice to multiply this entire thing by negative one half, just to eliminate the need for this negative two. So we can multiply this thing by negative one half and really not have any issue at all because we've got that right hand side is equal to zero. Okay, so let's just reiterate, we're gonna use this thing right here where sine of x is playing the role of alpha and pi over two minus cosine of x is playing the role of beta. So let's see, that'll give us sine of alpha plus beta over 2, but that's going to be sine of x um, plus pi over 2 minus cosine of x over 2. And then we'll have sine of alpha minus beta over 2. So let's see, that'll be sine of x plus cosine of x minus pi over 2 all over two. Okay, so we have that product of two sine functions is equal to zero. But if we've got the product of two real numbers equals zero, that means at least one of them is equal to zero. So that means we have this whole thing right here is equal to zero, or this whole thing right here is equal to zero. And we're actually only gonna work one of these out and I'll leave the other one for homework. And so we will do this one. So I'll put a star around it. And then the case where this is equal to zero, the sine of this big thing right here, sine of x plus cosine of x minus pi over two over two equals zero. I'll leave that as a nice little homework exercise. It'll follow fairly similarly or almost exactly the same way as this right here. Okay, so we've got sine of this big thing is equal to zero, but let's recall that sine of theta equals zero if and only if theta is equal to n times pi, where n is some integer. Okay, but that tells us that this is equal to n times pi. And when I say this, I mean all of this big argument of our sine function. So let's write that down. We have sine of x plus pi over two minus cosine of x over two equals n times pi, but I'll clear the denominator. And we have this is two n pi 
for some integer n. Okay. So now what we'd like to do is maybe move this pi over two to the right hand side. And that gives us sine of x uh, minus cosine of x equals, and then we'll have two n pi minus pi over two, but maybe we could rewrite that as four n minus one over two times pi. Okay, so just to reiterate what we have, this whole thing right here, which I've starred with yellow, is equal to zero if and only if we have this sine x minus cosine x is equal to this 4n minus 1 over 2 times pi. But now I'd like to smash these things together, but I can't quite do that unless I manipulate them a little bit. And I'll do that by multiplying by a common value of sine and cosine. And that common value will be one over the square root of two. So let's multiply this whole thing by one over the square root of two. That gives us a square root of two down here in the denominator because we have to do both sides of the equation. And here we're using the fact that sine of pi over four equals the cosine of pi over four equals the square root of two over two or one over the square root of two. So really maybe the proper thing to do would be to view these things on the right and the left hand side as cosine pi over four and sine pi over four respectively. Okay, nice. But now we can see that this is exactly in the form of the right hand side of this difference formula for sine. So that means we can turn this left-hand side into, like I said, the difference formula for sine. So that gives us sine of x minus pi over four equals this thing right here. So we've got four n minus one over two times the square root of two times pi. But now we'd like to start noticing that this is problematic if n is large. But now let's play a little inequality game on this. So. First up, maybe we'll notice that two times the square root of two is less than three. And that may not be, seem super obvious unless you square both sides. And that is eight is less than nine, which is pretty clear. But then if we take the reciprocal, we get the inequality in the other direction. So let's take the reciprocal and replace this two square root of two with three. And that'll leave us with four n minus one times pi over three. But pi is bigger than one, so that means this whole thing is bigger than four n minus one. And then in that step, what we've done is just replaced pi with the number three. Pi is, like I said, larger than three. And now that we're at this point of the inequality, we're actually gonna break it into another set of cases. That first case will be if n is bigger than or equal to one. But that immediately gives us a problem. Notice if n is bigger than or equal to 1, then this thing is strictly bigger than 1. But now we've got a value of sine here is strictly bigger than 1, which is impossible. And then from there, we obviously have two more cases. The case when n is equal to 0 or the case when n is negative. So I'll quickly look at the case when n is zero, and then I'll let you guys work at, look at the case when n is negative on your own. So let's notice if n is zero, we have the sine of x minus pi over four is equal to negative pi over two times the square root of two. But then by our same argument that we have over there, this is strictly less than negative one. But again, that's not possible because sine is never less than negative one. It's always between negative one and one. So we've got a problem there as well. And then the case when n is negative works very similarly. Okay, so now between this and the homework exercise, we have this equation here has no solution. So now we'll go ahead and show that this inequality is always satisfied. 
We just got done showing that cosine of sine of x is not equal to sine of cosine of x for all real numbers x. Now we'll prove that this inequality indeed holds. And we'll do that by defining a function, and that function will be this difference here. So this will be cosine of sine of x minus sine of cosine of x. And notice that we have the following fact from the work that we've done so far, and that is f of x is not equal to zero for all real numbers x. So another thing that we have, so maybe a second fact, if you will, is f is a continuous function. So that's pretty easy to see because it's a composition of continuous functions that are continuous on the whole real number line. So that implies continuity. Okay, now let's look at a couple of values or actually we only need to look at one value of f of x. So we'll just say, let's note that if we evaluate f at zero, we get cosine of sine of zero minus sine of cosine of zero. Okay, but let's see, sine of zero is equal to zero, and cosine of zero is equal to one. So this gives us cosine of zero, which is one, minus sine of one. But we immediately know that sine of one is not equal to one, because the only time that sine is ever equal to one is at odd multiples of pi over two. So that means this is bigger than zero. Notice definitely bigger than zero, not bigger than or equal to zero by something that we showed up here. Okay, so now we see that f is at least sometimes positive. So now really to kind of beat this into the ground, let's by way of contradiction, suppose we have an x naught such that f of x naught is negative. Okay, so that would be supposing that this inequality did not hold. Notice this inequality in terms of our function is that this function is bigger than zero for all real numbers x. So we've shown it's bigger than zero for zero. Now we wanna finish that off, but we'll do that, like I said, by way of contradiction. So let's suppose we've got x naught such that f evaluated at x naught is negative, but by the intermediate value theorem, we have some number c between um, zero and x naught. I say between instead of like less than or equal to one and greater than or equal to the other because we don't know the ordering of zero and x naught such that f evaluated at c is equal to zero. And that's because this intermediate value zero is between a positive number, which is f of zero, and this supposed negative value, which is f of x naught. But that's a contradiction because it contradicts what we did on the last board. So like I said, we have a contradiction, but what did we contradict? Well, we contradicted this assumption that we made right here where there exists an x naught where f of x naught is negative. So this must not be true. And thus, we've proven that f of x is always positive, which means this inequality holds. And that's a good place to stop.